Hello, and welcome to the special edition of Cronkite News. I'm Jasmine Spearing Bowen. Thanks for joining us. One of our Cronkite News reporting teams puts a special focus on sustainability and the environment. Tonight, a look back at some of their top stories. A growing herd of bison near the Grand Canyon is threatening some of its fragile ecosystem. Arizona PBS and Cronkite News reporter Drew, Drew Marine were granted exclusive access to the area where the herd roams to learn about plans to thin out the population. Bison were brought to the Grand Canyon in the early 1900s to a wildlife viewing area, but when they weren't useful, they were left to roam. Those 100 animals now number 400 to 600, and they're wiping out everything in their path. Some 200 miles from the south rim of the Grand Canyon, a trek through a thick forest of fallen trees and muddy trails with biologist Brandon Holton leads to a landscape of meadows devoid of vegetation and depleted of water sources. Out here, you just have our meadows are just overgrazed to the point where, you know, our grass is this high. Overgrazed by these behemoths. Up to 1,400 pound bison grazing to ensure their own survival, but at the same time threatening the future of other wildlife inside the Kaibab National Forest. This area used to be covered in plants and had plenty of running water, but because of the bison's impact, it's more of a mud hole. And now it's affecting animals like deer and bats. And when they come here, um, they can't access this water. They need, you know, ponded type water in order to drink, in order to come down and glean the water sur surface and drink. Um, here, it's, it's, we don't have that condition anymore. So the National Park Service is planning to recruit gun-toting volunteers to help cull the herd from about 600 to 200, rather than watch the number of bison triple in size over the next 10 years. I'm a little bit upset that that there was this decision to only plan for the shorter term. Conservationists are disheartened that hunting is the first option being deployed. I would hate to see the Kaibab National Forest and Great King and National Park turned into a game farm for this species. Gitlin, like many others against the culling, insist there are other solutions. The park is capable of getting these animals rounded up um, and getting them contained and transported in a humane manner. And I would like to see that be the primary mechanism of moving these animals. That's sort of a struggle that the National Park Service has, I, I would say, is um, how best to manage all resources within the park. Um, one resource being the bison, one resource being water, one resource being vegetation. While the culling hasn't happened quite yet, the federal government is hoping to reduce the number of bison as soon as possible and see some positive results in the park. Right now we're focusing on the short term, um, but we will continue to look long term as well as we study what happens with this um, initial uh, herd reduction. In the meantime, these bison will continue to leave their mark on the area. Yeah, we just picked up the bison trail right through here and then got to this point and um, spooked a small herd right through the woods here. This herd can call the North Rim their home for now, roaming the forests and meadows until the end of the year. The Park Service is considering whether some of the bison will be captured and moved to other parks or Indian communities that agree to take them. But the reduction program is expected to start early next year. Drew Marine, Cronkite News. Salt cedar trees are being removed in the Southwest Valley. Cronkite News reporter Holly Bach shows us how clearing the trees will prevent future flooding of homes and businesses. More than 15,000 acres along the Gila River are filled with salt cedar trees, trees that were originally planted in the late 1800s to help control erosion. Buckeye, Avondale, and the Maricopa County Flood Control District said they are removing the trees because they are extremely flammable and grow in an area that is already prone to flooding. This is a big thing to Buckeye. The future could be we have floods and fires in the south part of the city, and that's not good. These cedar trees behind me are the ones that the city of Buckeye will potentially be taking down along the Gila River. There's estimated about 200 homes that are in that area that would be at risk in a major flooding event. Um, so there's a high priority to, you know, on the life safety, uh, public safety end of it, a number of different facets to, uh, to restore the river, clean out the salt cedar and allow the river to flow again uh, without obstructions and spreading out. Arizona Game and Fish have been working with the cities to replace the trees in the area with cottonwoods and willows. They're also keeping an eye on the creatures that live in these areas. So what we're concerned with really is um, kind of those threatened and endangered species and trying to find where we can 
take a look at with our pilot projects and with some of this um, more collaborative effort and strategizing where we want to make these pockets of high quality habitat that we want to keep. Wolf Crowder hopes the birds like the southwest willow flycatcher and smaller creatures will make the newly planted trees their homes. In Buckeye, Holly Bach, Cronkite News. Lake Powell is infested with invasive mussels that can ruin boats and damage the Glen Canyon recreation area. Officials are taking the 10-year battle against quagga mussels to a new level. Reporter, reporter Erica Arrington traveled to Lake Powell to see the impact these mussels are having on the ecosystem there. Officials who oversee Lake Powell have been fighting for a decade to keep quagga mussels from invading this tourism destination, but they lost the battle. We were doomed uh, from that November in 2012. In 2012, the first quagga mussel was discovered here at Lake Powell. Today, the quagga mussels have invaded every canyon of the lake. Now, the war is to keep the mussels from spreading outside of Lake Powell. Some have already been spotted in Lake Mead. Well, this is a flip-flop. It may not look a whole lot. You can see a strap there, the overall foot shape. Uh, this is what those mussels do. The mussels latch onto the Glen Canyon Dam and can cut off water flow. They strip paint off boats and cause even more damage. They're in the dam where they can c cut off uh, the flow of water. And so for water users, electricity users, um, it becomes a, a cost to the taxpayer. The park officials inspect every boat going in and out out of the lake. Boaters who do not comply can receive a fine as high as $5,000. Please, um, when you're leaving uh, Lake Powell and or any body of water, uh, remember to clean your boat. Experts say keeping the quagga mussels in Lake Powell is the only option to contain the threat. We got to quit moving water. You got to wash and drain your boat every time. Uh, just as simple as that. At Lake Powell, Erica Arrington, Cronkite News. A quarter million dollar grant will help an urban farm that feeds the homeless. To do even more, reporter Tim Johns takes us to St. Vincent de Paul's urban farm to see what this money will mean. Nika Forte is the coordinator for the St. Vincent de Paul Society's Urban Farm, a program designed to combat food insecurity for homeless people by providing them food grown freshly on their farm. It was to get more of the um, homeless guests that we service on campus eating more nutritious and healthy foods. For many of the people that St. Vincent serves, the food provided to them is an invaluable part of their lives and might be the only meal that they have all day. Having a meal and a wholesome meal, like fresh vegetables and fresh fruits, uh, gives uh, helps these people uh, get out and go to work. Although founded only four years ago, the program has proven successful and now feeds hundreds of people every day. The farm will now undergo a massive renovation thanks to a $250,000 grant that it received from Valley Partnership. That money will help the project to expand its services to include providing educational and employment training. We're also doing, starting up an apprenticeship program where we partner with more Martori farms and some of our local no nurseries and farms to get clients who work with us in the urban farm working, uh, the skills they need to work, and get back into society to be more sustainable and can take care of themselves. Because for Forte, it's not just about helping those in need. It's more than just a place for us to grow food. Um, we want it to be kind of a vehicle for whole health and wellness. And Forte is looking forward to having her plate full with the new program starting up on the farm. In Phoenix, Tim Johns, Cronkite News. The Urban Farms Renovations will double its current growing capacity in addition to providing the new apprenticeship programs. The farm plans to have renovations completed by Saturday, November 4th. What started out as upgrading two water treatment plants in the southern part of our state is now also engaging in the community with the outdoors. Cronkite News reporter Courtney Malley went to Tucson to get a first-hand look, look at how they've done it. Courtney? The Living River Project is an annual water quality report put together by the Sonoran Institute. However, this annual report has done more than just bring new plants and new fish to the area. I went down to Tucson to see the difference a few years can make. 
It's been supporting people for the last 12,000 years. Running through southern Arizona, the Santa Cruz River has seen many environmental changes through the years. The latest, after a series of upgrades in wastewater treatment started in 2013. The impact of clean water goes beyond the riverbank. Students in the community visit the river and learn about the environment around them. Those visits turning into colorful yeah, art projects. Okay. Maria Jenis, a biology teacher at Tucson High, takes her class on field trips to the Santa Cruz River. It's a really wonderful project because water is so much a part of biology. And so it allows me to begin the year talking about the importance of water and weave it through everything that we do and then actually go and see a living river. I think the students surprise themselves. Civil engineer Evan Camfield has been with this project since its inception. The treatment plants were the biggest infrastructure projects that Pima County had ever done, $660 million. The Living River was a way to tell the story of, so what was the effect on the ecosystem and the benefits to the community. We're not the only ones who have turned you know, a liability to an amenity. And although there have been many improvements in the terms of water quality, there are residents in the area that say even more needs to be done. I have noticed that the um, odors from this particular area have been worse than normal. I think a lot more muddy days than clear lately. And while more improvements are always welcome, Claire Zugmeyer, who's been tracking the progress of the Santa Cruz River for the last five years, says they're well on their way. The improvements have been really great for the environment, but also really good just for people in recreating or living in the area prior to the upgrades. We're really tracking and communicating river health so people understand the value of this upgrade. The Santa Cruz is the reason we can call Tucson home. The Sonoran Institute is going to continue to follow the status of the river throughout the coming year. And you can see the art of the students on a link on the Pima County homepage. Courtney Malley in downtown Phoenix, Cronkite News. The initiative to help enhance a canal system in Phoenix is now underway. Cronkite News reporter Sierra Delgado checks out the construction on the Grand Canal. Work is now underway to transform the Grand Canal from this to this. Lindsay Bear has used the canal system along 7th Street through Central Phoenix for eight years. I'm excited that they're going to do some landscaping because the other canal system obviously works a lot better for you know, visually, and it's used a lot by people on bikes and feet. But that hasn't always been the case. We've built our back to the canals. We've faced them away from the canals and treated them like alleyways, and there was graffiti, and it just wasn't considered beautiful. So this whole movement of canalscape embraces the canals as placemakers for connection and recreation and all, all those good things. The Grand Canal cuts through the center of the city of Phoenix, stretching from Glendale all the way to Tempe, which means that construction along the canal will be done in two parts. The plans include putting in lighting, landscaping, and public art. Obviously, if they want to increase foot traffic, you know, make it more attractive. But there's way more people. Like, like I said, when I moved to Central Phoenix um, seven or eight years ago, there was not a lot of like people exercising and now like especially like on a Sunday morning all past like six or seven people were just running. Rosart says the Grand Canalscape is a project that is designed to help pedestrians and bike riders feel safer along the canal and connect the canal to the communities that it surrounds. In Phoenix, Sierra Delgado, Cronkite News. The first phase will include construction happening along 15th Avenue to 16th Street all the way to 40, 40th Street, according to Arizona Forward. Phase one is expected to be completed by fall 2018. It's that time of year when lots of people who work outside feel a little relief, including southern Arizona ranchers. I met one who's using sustainable cattle ranching near Nogales. Just try to be smarter than a cow, which has been a huge challenge to me. Dean Fish's bachelor's, master's, and doctorate degrees in animal science and reproductive physiology show he has the book smarts at least over his herd. Fish says there are three keys when striving to become better with sustainability and ranching, economic, environmental, and social. I want to continue to stay in business. Um, you know, in, in the livestock business, you're not, you're not going to become wealthy, but if you can make a fair living, um, I think that's that's my goal. The environmental standpoint. I want to leave this land in better shape than when I um, became the manager of it, became the caretaker of it. And the socially acceptable standpoint. You know, so we want to create a low stress situation. We want to make sure the cows are comfortable and that we're taking 
the proper care of those and um, doing a good job with that and producing beef for America. Ranchers like Dean are working hard to implement sustainable practices, including water harvesting and pasture rotation on ranches just like this. The more that we learn about the science of sustainably using land in cattle production, the more effective we can be um, and, and the less the risk that we're gonna do something irreversible that we're gonna regret in the future. With genetics and genomics coming into play, Dean buys bulls that he is able to obtain background information on, such as their ancestors' birth and weaning weights. We can even finer tune those selection criteria for based on what our goals are. You know, again, you know, ultimately our goal is to produce a safe, wholesome, um, tasty, nutritious product that's going to go on America's plates. Dean raises these Angus-based cows until they are seven to nine months old. Once they have reached the right size and wean age, he markets them through the livestock auction. Probably the key to success for a livestock producer is to continue to seek out that knowledge, continue to strive to become better producers at whatever system they're doing. There's no one size fits all. In Nogales, Holly Bach, Cronkite News. Fashion choices have a direct impact on the environment. That was the message at the City of Phoenix's Sustainability Fashion Show. Cronkite News reporter Tatum Hubble shows us how we can be more environmentally conscious about our clothes. The City of Phoenix kicked off next month's Fashion Week by hosting a show on sustainable clothing, where models wore clothes made out of recycled materials put together by local designers. It's important to focus on sustainable or green clothing because there's tremendous waste in our consumption. We have started to treat clothes like they're disposable. We don't keep them as long as we used to. They go into the landfills faster than ever. The longer you keep your clothes, the better it is for the environment. The Phoenix City Council has set sustainability goals to promote green living and simple aspects of life, like making smart choices with the clothes you wear and the ways you care for them. Just like recycling trash, you can reduce your carbon footprint when it comes to clothing by donating unwanted items and even shopping secondhand. The City of Phoenix is trying to get to zero waste by 2050. Our residential customers could fill our stadium seven times bottom to top with the amount of what we just throw out every year. Hartman said the show was a fun and educational way to introduce Fashion Week, which starts October 5th. In Phoenix, Tatum Hubble, Cronkite News. Phoenix Fashion Week takes place at the Talking Stick Resort in Scottsdale. Fire crews here in Arizona are heading to Northern California to help fight the deadly blazes that have been raging since Sunday. Reporter Sydney Eisenberg explains why this request is different from past fire seasons. Help was deployed last night and this morning from the Arizona Department of Forestry and Fire Management Dispatch Center to help fight the fires burning up in Northern California. This is definitely not unusual. Um, what kind of is unusual is the amount of resources that they did request. The Arizona Department of Forestry and Fire Management sent out 150 firefighters as well as 55 fire engines and trucks similar to this one right here to help battle the blaze in California. They'll patrol the neighborhoods. Uh, they'll provide initial attack protection as far as, you know, watering down the grounds, trying to keep the fire at bay. 8,000 firefighters are currently tackling the 22 fires burning in Northern California. At least 29 people have died and 20,000 were forced to evacuate. The fires have burned more than 190,000 acres of land. In Phoenix, Sydney Eisenberg, Cronkite News. Volunteers drove trucks into the desert and hauled out loads of trash in the 8th annual cleanup of Tonto National Forest. Cronkite News reporter Tatum Hubble shows us how the volunteers work to maintain Arizona's natural beauty in the Four Peaks area. Every November, volunteers spread out across Tonto National Forest on a mission to collect tons of trash. They find everything from furniture to hundreds of bullet shells. When we first started this cleanup, we started with a simple compactor truck and we loaded that up in, in no time. And then in subsequent years, we went to two 40-yard roll-off dumpsters and now we're filling four 40-yard 40 40 roll-off dumpsters every year. Uh, last year, we hauled out 27,000 pounds of garbage. The year before that, in 2015, it was uh, 47,000. Members of the Copper State Four Wheelers Club organized the Four Peaks cleanup. They hope the amount of trash collected will continue to decline. Take back what you bring out. Don't leave any trash you shoot up. Make sure you take it back with you. You know, the ultimate goal would be to put the Copper State Four Wheelers out of a job where they don't have to pick up 40,000 tons of trash 
every year. Four Peaks Cleanup is dedicated to preserving Tonto National Forest and preventing the amount of trash being discarded in Arizona's desert. According to the U.S. Forest Service, nearly six million people visit the forest every year for recreational activities like target shooting, hiking, and horseback riding. It's very important we come every year to clean this up because if we leave this trash here, they're eventually going to close this place. Forest advocates urge visitors to act responsibly and take out their trash. In Tonto National Forest, Tatum Hubble, Cronkite News. Starting November 20th, people who bring inappropriate shooting targets like propane tanks into Tonto National Forest may be fined up to $5,000. We recycle trash, so why not bikes? A new shop in Mesa teaches cyclists of all ages how to repair, maintain, and recycle bicycles. Reporter Emily Richardson gives us a spin around the new location. He's been helping me with my bike, and he's been telling me what to do, and I've been doing it. It helped me learn how to fix bikes. And that's one of the goals of WeCycle. WeCycle is a community bike shop, nonprofit, recycling bicycles for kids and adults in need. Founder Robert Chacon started this organization while working in vocational rehabilitation. He saw that the people he helped get jobs had transportation issues. He began fixing bikes out of his garage to give to them. When his garage couldn't fit any cars because of how many bikes he had, he decided to open this shop. It's, it's more than just a bike shop. We, we don't sell bikes. We don't have bikes, uh, you know, with parts and all this stuff like a bike shop. We're just open to the public so they can come in and work on their bikes. So it's, it's a good thing to teach people how to fix their own bicycles. And Chacon wants them to learn how at a young age. We try to teach the kids responsibility. We try to teach them um, recycling. Uh, we try to teach them that bicycles are an, a viable form of transportation. Leonel Puga came in with his brother. They had their eyes on two bikes that needed some work. I saw a bike and I really liked it. All the Puga boys needed to do was put in the work to get them road ready. My favorite part is really just teaching the kids. And for adults in need of wheels, all it takes is eight hours of volunteering. Chacon is motivated to help anyone who has a desire to ride, no matter what age. I had a 90-year-old grandmother come in with, to get her, her great-grandkids bikes, but she had never ridden a bike before. She had never owned a bike or ridden a bike. And I fixed her a bike, and I taught her how to ride a bike. In Mesa, Emily Richardson, Cronkite News. If you would like to donate to WeCycle or would like to learn how to work on your bike, the shop is located on Main Street in Mesa. Over the weekend, the park surrounding the Tempe Center for the Arts got a little upgrade. Cronkite News reporter Emily Bloom is in the studio to throw some shade on the situation. Over the years, the parks along Tempe Town Lake have lost quite a few trees due to storms. So to replace some of those trees and to jumpstart a new goal to increase shade areas, all around Tempe, a group of volunteers spent their Saturday morning digging up dirt. Parks along Tempe Town Lake are due for some improvement. They give us paper and they give us oxygen. And while these Girl Scouts weren't exactly experts when they started, nothing so far, they caught on quickly. There you go. This event marks the first big step towards a goal of 25% tree and shade cover on city property within Tempe. To help the community. As city officials work to achieve that goal by 2040, Arizona State University partnered with them to learn exactly how much shade these new trees will provide. There will be a, a, a small benefit in terms of the cooling that's provided from the 100 trees we planted today, but I, I think creating a more inviting space uh, is really our, our purpose out here. David Hondula studies heat in urban areas, how it affects people, and what can be done to make it more bearable. What we see behind us here is a bit of a designed experiment. There are different types of trees in different places scattered throughout the parks. Which we hope can shed light on similar projects in other places around the city. What arrangement and configuration of trees do people find most appealing, uh, most inviting, and produce the greatest environmental benefits in terms of cooling? This is a longer term project. It's going to take a long time for these little guys to grow into be big, beautiful trees. And they hope that the volunteers planting trees here will inspire others to donate their time. Many folks were just out here to, to lend a hand, and that gave me a lot of optimism that the future could be a green and cool one for our city. Schnapp Farms is the largest grower of peaches in Arizona, but this year some of the blossoms are popping up too soon. Emily Bloom is in Queen Creek with more on why our weather may be to blame. Here in Arizona, we've had an unusually warm fall so far, and Schnapp Farms is dealing with the effects of that. 
Every November, Schnepp Farms owners wrap up their pumpkin festival and begin preparing for holiday events. We just have an issue of, of uh, the trees being confused. But this year... We've got a tiny little peach that's growing inside of there. They're seeing something a bit unusual. My wife was out here. We have a wedding venue nearby, and so she was walking through the orchard and said, oh my gosh, she, ca she calls me up on the phone and says, Mark, there's some, some bloom out here. And I said, nah, can't be. Schnepp says something. the blossoms aren't supposed to come until February. I started walking and realized it wasn't just an isolated one tree incident. It's um, it's scattered throughout uh, throughout the orchard. He says usually by this time of year we've had a cold snap that puts the trees to sleep for the winter. But meteorologist Paul Inigith says so far we've had above normal temps for the month of November. Uh, October had no measurable rainfall here in Phoenix and that was the second time that that has happened. The second time in as long as records have been kept. Inigeth says as of right now, we're on track to have the warmest year ever. I grew up here on the farm. I've been growing peaches for 40 years. I've never seen bloom this time of year before. Fortunately, the farm has about 5,000 peach trees, so your supply for the upcoming spring isn't entirely on the line. But as for the confused trees? It's already bloomed. The blossoms have dried up and gone. This area is not going to bloom again, so um, we've lost the crop of peaches on this part of the tree. Schnepf and his wife have been watching the trees closely, and they haven't noticed any more blooms, so they're hoping the trees are now Dormant. I mean, they look good. It's just the wrong time of year. To make up for the lack of rain that we've seen over the past couple of months, Schnepf has been watering this entire area. In Queen Creek, Emily Bloom, Cronkite News. Thanks for joining us for the special edition of Cronkite News. For more multimedia coverage, go to cronkitenews.azpbs.org and click on the Sustainability tab.